Happy Sabbath, friends. Wow. This is a special Sabbath in the year of the Loma Linda University Church. Every year, this is the Sabbath where we have baccalaureate services for the schools of medicine, dentistry, and pharmacy. I feel sad for those of you who are graduates this year that we're not here in the church to celebrate together, but I want you to know that you're not far from our hearts. You're in our thoughts, our minds. We celebrate with you. We offer you our congratulations, our warmest congratulations, and we pray for God's blessing on you as you move into your new life ahead. May God walk with you every step of the way. September 11, 1992, the island of Kauai. It was on that day that the most extreme storm in Hawaii recorded history, Hurricane Iniki, hit Kauai. It was brutal, devastating. It pretty much leveled everything in its path, including the Pacific Sportswear Company, a mom-and-pop operation, a family business. They were destroyed by Hurricane Oniki. In fact, what happened specifically was that on their warehouse and their print shop, the roof caved in. The roof caved in and damaged all their inventory. How did it damage it, you ask? Well, pretty simply, there is something called Hawaii red clay. Now, I'm not familiar with Hawaii red clay personally. I've not experienced it, but from what I read, Hawaii red clay, clay, kawaii red clay, is a clay that is as indelible as permanent ink. And so all the inventory, the t-shirts from the Pacific Sportswear Company were dyed in, damaged by, stained with kawaii red ink. It was devastating, destroyed, demolished finished when the roof caved in. Can you imagine standing there on September 12, once the storm has blown by, and you're surveying the wreckage? What are you going to do? This has been your life. Now the roof has caved in, and your question is, then what? Well, maybe you answer that question by saying, oh, I can imagine I can imagine that very easily because that's been my life. Maybe it was over the last few months, just life, the different challenges that came your way, financial reversals, job loss, marital discord and dissolution, conflict between parent and child. Maybe it was something else. But you know exactly what it feels like to stand there and survey the wreckage of what was your normal, ordinary life. You know what it's like when the roof caves in. The question you have, the question I have, maybe is the same question the owners of the Pacific Sportswear Company had. What then? What do we do next? How do we respond? I want to take you to a psalm in the ancient hymn book of Israel. Psalm 44. I want to take you to Psalm 44 and survey this psalm to get a sense of what might come after the roof caves in. Psalm 44 is a national lament. There has been a dramatic military defeat, and the people simply don't know what to do with that, how to face that, how to respond. We're not exactly sure what military defeat it was. Scholars wonder about that. There are a few different possibilities, two principally. But I believe, from what I can read and see in the text, as well as in the story of God's people in the Old Testament, that the most likely event that occasioned this psalm was Josiah's defeat in battle. Remember Josiah? King Josiah came to the throne as, as just a, an adolescent. He was a good king. In fact, as you read Josiah's story in 2 Kings, you find that he leads the people in national repentance, national reform. He calls them back to God. 
They destroy the high places of idol worship. They smash the idols. He calls them away from engagement with the pagan gods around around them, back to the worship of the true God. He institutes the Passover. Josiah is leading them in reform. It's a very important time in Israel's history. And then something happens. The honest truth I had never connected until this week's study, Josiah, with this psalm. But this psalm makes sense to me when I think of Josiah's story. Because so often, as I have read Josiah's story, Josiah's story of repentance and reform and revival, and then I come to two verses toward the end of 2 Kings 23, I pull up short and think, what happened? Because in those two verses, the story is told of Josiah going to battle with King Necho of Egypt, Egypt, 609 B.C., and Josiah being killed in battle in 609 B.C. And it made me wonder, as I read that story so many times, what happened? Well, I don't think I was the only one wondering what happened. I think the sons of Korah, the psalmists in this psalm, were wondering the very same thing. So let's read Psalm 44. We're going to read it mostly straight through, but stopping here and there for comments or quotes. So we start with the first stanza, Psalm 44, verse 1. We have heard it with our ears, O God. Our ancestors have told us what you did in their days, in days long ago. With your hand you drove out the nations and planted our ancestors. You crushed the peoples and made our ancestors flourish. It was not by their sword that they won the land, nor did their arm bring them victory. It was your right hand, your arm, the light of your face, for you loved them. In this first stanza... The psalmist is saying, we know what you're capable of, God, because our ancestors have told us the story of what you did in their day. Living in this land, it's because of you. It wasn't our might. It wasn't our military prowess. It wasn't our weaponry. It was none of that. It was your hand, your right arm, the light on your face. That's what our ancestors have told us. And the psalmist continues to believe that as we move into the second stanza. Verse 4. You are my king and my God who decrees victories for Jacob. Through you we push back our enemies. Through your name we trample our foes. I put no trust in my bow. My sword does not bring me victory. But you give us victory over our enemies. You put our adversaries to shame. In God we make our boast all day long. And we will praise your name forever. As you listen to the psalmist and what the psalmist says, you can picture yourself standing in a worship service. Shoulder to shoulder with other worshipers. Do you remember what that was like? You can picture yourself standing there and singing from the heart, from your soul. Maybe you're singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Maybe you're singing a praise song. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns in power above. With wisdom, power, and love, our God is an awesome God. You sing with all your heart. Praise to God. That's what the psalmist is doing. Our ancestors told us. And we believe that, God. Praise your name. But then as you sing, you feel a twinge in your heart, deep in your soul. You think, I'm singing these words. I'm trying to put heart and soul into it. The truth be told, I don't know what's going on in my life. It feels like the roof has caved in. It feels like that covering of God's protection is gone. And now I am exposed to the elements, to the hurricane, to the Kauai red dirt. You think about your life. I don't know what storm has blown into your life. Conflict with a loved one? Bounce checks from your bank? Red slip, pink slip, 
from your employer, a marriage that is dissolving before your eyes, or right now, even COVID-19. My wife, you say, has, has COVID. Or you say, my husband has lost his job. My, my children can't take being isolated any longer. They're driving us crazy. And here I stand, singing praise to God. You can picture yourself making the effort to continue singing so that those around you don't notice your doubt. But in your heart you say, I'm saying the words, but something's wrong. The roof is caved in. I'm no longer covered by God's protection. Well, if you feel that, if you sense that in your soul, you're not alone. Because in verse 9, the psalmist changes directions with two words. He changes directions. Remember, he's been talking about what he says our ancestors have told us. We believe you were active, God. But with two words at the beginning of verse 9, he changes both the focus of time and the reality of the experience. Those two words are, but now. But now, so he's shifting to the current day, to the present time, and to a very different kind of experience. So let's continue reading. Verse 9. But now you have rejected and humbled us. You no longer go out with our armies. You made us retreat before the enemy, and our adversaries have plundered us. You gave us up to be devoured like sheep and have scattered us among the nations. You sold your people for a pittance, gaining nothing from their sale. You have made us a reproach to our neighbors, the scorn and derision of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations. The people shake their head at us. I live in disgrace all day long and my face is covered with shame at the taunts of those who reproach and revile me because of the enemy who is bent on revenge." Wow. What happened to the praise music? What happened to the doxology? What happened to praising God from whom all blessings flow? Now the psalmist, now the sons of Korah are saying everything has gone wrong. The roof has caved in. There is no protection over our heads. And furthermore, not only has it all gone bad, but if you follow these verses, the psalmist is saying, you have done it to us, God. You have. You have made us a reproach. You have made us a byword. You sold us for a pittance. Do you know what that feels like? To feel like your life has gone wrong and that somehow it's God's punishment? I can imagine someone reading through this psalm, coming to that point and saying, well, <laughs> what do you expect? I mean, read the Old Testament account. All through the account, we have prophets coming to them over and over again, preaching, pleading, weeping, begging, come back to God. So when they got punished, hey, it was their choice. They got what they deserved. I can imagine someone saying that. But that's not the case here. That's not what happened in this instance. Remember, if indeed it is the battle Josiah lost in which he was killed, or even a second option is Hezekiah and Sennacherib earlier in 2 Kings. In either case, the people had turned. The king was good. Repentance was the word. Now of any time, God should protect them. In fact, that's where the psalmist turns next. Again, we're in Psalm 44. Now we start with verse 17. All this came upon us, though we had not forgotten you, 
We had not been false to our covenant. Our hearts had not turned back. Our feet had not strayed from your path. But you crushed us and made us a haunt for jackals. You covered us with deep darkness. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God have discovered it since he knows the secrets of the heart? Yet for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Understand clearly what the psalmist is saying. He's saying, all this happened to us, but it wasn't because we were unfaithful. No, we were faithful. We turned to you, and yet still, even though we were not unfaithful, the roof is caved in. And as he says right there in verse 22, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Wow. Wow. I want to read you a couple of Old Testament commentary quotes that think about what that verse says, where he says, For your sake we face death all day long. We are sheep to be slaughtered. So two brief quotes from two different commentaries. First one is this. He's talking about, this writer, about that statement. We, for your sake, are like sheep to be slaughtered. Here are the words of the commentary. For your sake does not mean here, as the English phrase usually does, that it was for the benefit of God that the Israelites had been slaughtered. Rather, it means that it was because of their devotion to God that they had been defeated and killed. Thus, the expression, for your sake, may be variously translated because of you, or because we follow you, or because we belong to you. That's why. Second quote from a commentary, this one, unpacking a little bit further the sense of that. In their fidelity to the Lord, they receive greater abuse than if they had conformed to the pagan world. So it's because we have been faithful to you that this has happened to us. Because we were. It would have gone better for us if we'd been unfaithful. But we've been faithful. And now the roof has caved in. Back to Psalm 44. So what does the psalmist do next? Verse 23. Awake, Lord. Why do you sleep? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? We are brought down to the dust. Our bodies cling to the ground. So the psalmist says, wake up, God. Rouse yourself. Do something. Again, a quote from an Old Testament commentary. This commentary, written for translators who are seeking to render the original faithfully in a second language. Speaking about those verses we just read, listen. The vivid expressions used as though God could be sleeping, as though He would hide Himself, as though He had forgotten His people in their affliction and oppression, should not be weakened in translation. Don't give in to that temptation, translator says the commentary. Don't soften it. Don't sand the hard edges off. It should not be weakened in translation. Back to the comment. This is a desperate cry born from deepest despair and bewilderment. The rhetorical questions in these verses are not requests for information. They are bitter complaints against God's apparent indifference to and neglect of His people as they suffer and die. I'm not asking for information, in other words, is what the commentary is saying about the psalmist. I'm crying out in my bitterness of heart. In fact, another commentary says that this particular psalm was so bitter that it was not used in the synagogue service. The psalmist 
the sons of Korah, the people of Israel stand surveying the wreckage. A type of hurricane Iniki has roared through and destroyed everything in its path. And they are left asking, God, what now? When this happens, then what? Well, I want to suggest three implications from this psalm. Three implications that might be worth pondering. Implication number one. When the roof caves in, it can even cave in on people who are faithful to God. When the roof caves in, it can even cave in on people who are faithful to God. Remember, the two primary contexts possible for this psalm are Hezekiah and Sennacherib. And the one that I believe is probably the case, Josiah and Necho of Egypt. In both cases, there was faithfulness. In both cases, and especially in Josiah's case, there was repentance and confession and revival and faithfulness, and then the roof caved in. I want to read you, read to you from the words of a pastor named Lee Eklov. Simple story from his childhood. Remember, when the roof caves in, it can even cave in on those who are faithful to God. Eklov writes, when I was a kid in the mid-50s, Parker Brothers came out with a game for church families like ours. It was called Going to Jerusalem. Your playing piece wasn't a top hat or a Scotty dog like in the worldly game of Monopoly. In Going to Jerusalem, you got to be a real disciple. You were represented by a little plastic man with a robe, a beard, some sandals, and a staff. In order to move across the board, you looked up answers to questions in the little black New Testament provided with the game. I remember, says Eklov, that you always started in Bethlehem and you made stops at the Mount of Olives, Bethsaida, Capernaum, the Stormy Sea, Nazareth, and Bethany. If you rolled the dice well, you went all the way to a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But you never got to the crucifixion. There were no demons or angry Pharisees. You only made your way through the nice stories. It was a safe adventure, perfectly suited for a Christian family on a Sunday afternoon walk with Jesus. It never occurred to me while leaning over that card table, jiggling the dice in my hand, that traveling with Jesus wasn't meant for disciples who looked up verses in a little black Bible. If you're going to walk with Jesus as his disciple in this world, you may need to change your expectations. After all, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. The roof can even cave in on people who are faithful. Just ask Joseph. Ask Job. Ask Jeremiah. Ask John the Baptist. Ask Jesus himself. Implication number one of this psalm. When the roof caves in, it can even cave in on people who are faithful. Implication number two. When the roof caves in, it can even cave in on people whom God loves. The roof can even cave in on people whom God loves. So let me ask you a question. Do you suppose God loved Hezekiah? You suppose God loved Josiah? Do you suppose God loved the sons of Korah who composed this psalm? Do you suppose God loved Jesus? Or those other names? Joseph, Job, Jeremiah, John the Baptist. The roof can even cave in on people whom God loves. 
That's the witness. That's the testimony of Scripture. An Episcopal priest by the name of William Frey tells about how in his young adult days, he volunteered as an outreach ministry to read to a man named John who was blind. At one point, as they got to know each other a bit better, Frey asked John about his blindness. How did it happen? John said to him, it happened in a chemical explosion when I was 13. Wow, said Frey. How did you feel about that? How, how, how did you respond to it? I want to read to you John's words. Life was over, he said. I felt helpless. I hated God. For the first six months, I did nothing to improve my lot in life. I would eat all my meals alone in my room. One day, my father entered my room and said, John, winter's coming and the storm windows need to be up. That's your job. I want those hung by the time I get back this evening or else. Then he turned, walked out of the room, and slammed the door. I got so angry, says John. I thought, who does he think I am? I'm blind. I was so angry that I decided to do it. I felt my way to the garage, found the windows, located the necessary tools, found the ladder, all the while muttering under my breath, I'll show him, I'll fall, then they'll have a blind and paralyzed son. John then continued, Well, I got the windows up, and I found out later that never at any moment was my father more than four or five feet from my side. Make no mistake about it. Even for those whom God loves, even with those with whom God huddles near, the roof can cave in. That's implication number two. And implication number three, here it is. When the roof caves in, don't stop talking to God, no matter how raw or real it is. When the roof caves in, don't stop talking to God, no matter how raw or real it is. When we read the psalm moments ago, we read all the way through the psalm except for the last verse, verse 26. Now I want to read that last verse. There are two elements in that verse that we can't miss. Here it is, Psalm 44, 26. Speaking to God, the psalmist, one of the sons of Korah, says, Rise up and help us. Redeem us because of your unfailing love. I really like the way Eugene Peterson rendered that verse in the message paraphrase. Here's how he rendered it. Get up and come to our rescue. If you love us so much, help us. Two elements to that verse. The first element is this. What we read in this verse, in fact, what we read in the entire psalm, is unvarnished entreaty. Unvarnished entreaty. It is plea, it is petition, it is the heart, the helpless and humble heart of the psalmist on full display. In other words, it is raw and it is real. When the roof caves in, don't stop talking to God. No matter how raw and how real is your prayer. Once more a story, this one the story of a, of a poet, Christian Wyman. A poet who had wondered from God, says when he got to college, the influence of the professors and all that was happening in his program, undergrad or graduate, all that happened there robbed him of his faith. He lost his faith in God, had really no use for God. But then on his 39th birthday, he was diagnosed with an incurable form of blood cancer. 
he wrote about the agonizing effects of the disease and of the treatments. These are Wyman's words. I have had bones die and bowels fail. Joints lock in my face and arms and legs so I could not eat, could not walk. I have passed through pain I could never have imagined, pain that seemed to incinerate all my thoughts of God and to leave me sitting there in the ashes alone. So here you have a man who's left his faith aside, suffering untold agony, physically and no doubt emotionally and even spiritually. But then I want you to listen to his next word, Christian Wyman's next words. He found a friend in the suffering Messiah. He says, I am a Christian because of that moment on the cross when Jesus, drinking the very dregs of human bitterness, cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The point, says Wyman, is that God is with us, not beyond us, in suffering. I am a Christian because I understand that moment of Christ's passion to have meaning in my own life. And what it means is that the absolute solitary and singular nature of extreme human pain is an illusion. I'm not suggesting that ministering angels are going to come down and comfort you as you die. I'm suggesting that Christ's suffering shatters the iron walls around individual human suffering. In the face of brutal, isolating pain, we don't really want answers. We want a person, says Wyman. At such times, there is simply no substitute for the presence of Christ. As Wyman describes his experience, you get the image, the picture of a man who is wrestling deeply in his soul with his pain and with the sense that God is somehow not right next to him, crying out in the bitterness of his agony. It reminds me of Dave Dravecki, the one-time Major League Baseball pitcher who also, through cancer, just like Wyman, suffered profoundly. In fact, suffered to the degree that his arm and his shoulder had to be amputated. Reflecting back on that experience, Dravecki would later say, My wife Jan and I have learned something profound from this experience. We have learned something about the landscape. That's the word he uses, the landscape of faith. We have learned that there are mountains and there are wildernesses. On the mountains, says Dravecki, we are overwhelmed by the grandeur of God. And in the wilderness, we are overwhelmed by the absence of God. And this is what comes next. Dravecki says the key is to learn to kneel in both. On the mountain, we kneel in utter devotion. And in the wilderness, we kneel in utter dependence. Those elements are in this psalm. So when the roof of your life caves in, don't stop talking to God. No matter how raw, no matter how real. Because somewhere in the midst of your darkness, God stands by. In fact, the witness of the New Testament, the witness of the Apostle Paul, that verse we so often have quoted, Romans 8, 28, is that we know that in all things, even when the roof caves in, God is at work. God is at work. God is at work standing over the wreckage, trying to bring out of the wreckage something redemptive. You know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of Hurricane Iniki and Paradise Sportswear. Remember them? Devastated. Demolished, destroyed. All their inventory damaged, stained by kawaii red soil. A day or so later, the main boss in charge, against the advice of his wife and one of his business partners, decided he was going to do something. 
And so he loaded the laundry, washing machine after washing machine with all of his inventory. And in that inventory, he added water and soap, and he added a healthy helping of Kauai red soil. When he did that, he discovered two things. First thing he discovered was that there was some chemical in the soil that when washed with his inventory of t-shirts made that material soft and supple and comfortable. Second thing he discovered, he discovered that when he went down to the beach a day or so later, set up his booth and began to sell what he now called red dirt shirts. They sold like hotcakes to hungry children. By the end of the day, he had sold his entire inventory. And that wasn't the end of it. Some of you know what happened next. Red Dirt Shirt Company is sprouting up throughout Hawaii and as far away as Arizona and Utah. Red Dirt Shirts. I don't know where the roof has caved in in your life. I don't know. I don't know what the outcome will be. I wouldn't pretend to know what it's like to walk in your shoes through that dark time. But I do know something. I know that the roof can cave in even on people who are faithful, even on people whom God loves. And I know that God specializes in red dirt shirts. Just ask Joseph from pit to pinnacle. I know that God does remarkable things, especially with those who simply refuse to stop talking to God, no matter how raw, no matter how real. They keep talking, and they wait, and they wait. Because you just never know what God might do. Thank you.